Well, hello, and welcome to Opal City Confidential, a Starman podcast. I'm your host, Ross Aiken, and this has been a dream project of mine to do, something I've been talking about and really wanted to do, and I finally, you know, jumped the shark or whatever it is, and we're going to do it. This podcast will cover all the Starman from Ted Knight to Tom Kalor and Courtney Whitmore. The show will be focusing all the Starman, primarily on Jack and Ted. Uh, all the other Starmans will get their turn, and we will follow all their adventures, including Michael Thomas, Prince Gavin, Will Payton, as well as Starman adjacent heroes such as Star Spangled Kid, one and two, so Sylvester and Courtney, Courtney as Star Girl. The Justice Society of America when Starman is involved. Uh, Justice League JLA team-ups when Starman is involved, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's going to be a big uh, big job. I'm looking forward to it. And I'm hoping to have some guests come on to talk about their favorite Starmans or specific issues or some of the topics when we take breaks from a regular story. So let's get started with some of the basis of uh, Starman history. And we'll go from there. All right. Starman was created in, first appeared in 1940 in Adventure Comics 61. He was created by artist Jack Burnley. Mr. Burnley, based upon his work on Superman in Action Comics, was asked to create a new superhero. And that superhero was Starman. Starman's series in Adventure Comics ran from 61 to 101 in 1946. The series would be the home of many great creators, Jack Burnley, Gardner Fox, Alfred Bester, Mort Miskin, Emil Gershwin, Joe Samishan. Um, he would become a member of the Justice Society of America and appear in that their title in All-Star Comics. After the Golden Age had passed away, so did a lot of the heroes. Gardner Fox would correct that with the flash on two Earths uh, and its creation of his creation of Earth 2. Starman would soon appear in JLA and four team-ups in Brave and Bold and Showcase. And you can get my thoughts on those issues in a previous episode that uh, with, where I discussed it with my guest, the amazing Jennifer DeRoss, and I will post a link on uh, this, on its website, on the site. Uh, the pot, this podcast is about all the Starmen, but a little more about Jack and Ted, as I said earlier. But they will be the anchor that holds the show together. Each week, I will give you my thoughts on a specific issue of Starman-related comics. This episode today will be focused on Ted and Jack's first appearances. The next episode will focus on another Starman or Starmen. I, I don't want to leave a single one of them out or miss their time in the spotlight. So, let's begin. Adventure Comics 61 when sinister scientific forces seek to take over the nation by paralyzing power and communication facilities, they run afoul of a foe possessing power more potent than their own, a figure of night and mystery, the Starman, the amazing Starman. So that is the introduction from the top of the first page of the first Starman story in Adventure Comics 61. So let me give you the creative team data. This publication date of this comic was the 5th of March, 1941. Cover date, April 1941. Scripter Jack Burnley. Penciler, inker Jack Burnley. Colorist, Raymond Perry. Letterer, Betty Bentley. And editor, the amazing Whitney Ellsworth. And the title, as it said in that blurb, was The Amazing Starman. I'm reading these in the Starman archive because for some reason none of this is on the DC app and it's something I hope is uh, as they add more omnibuses and books they add the archive series which I think would be great but that's neither said they're done so let's talk about this comic and let me give you a quick synopsis and this is from the DC fandom database Weird events transpire all over the country. Communication systems and power plants, as well as an internal combustion engines, malfunction and are destroyed. FBI agent Woodley Allen is puzzled by the disasters and decides to contact a mystery man who can help. To summon him, Woodley unscrews a metal capsule. Meanwhile, in Gotham City's most fashionable club, a young Mr. Knight suddenly decides to leave his company, Miss Lee, on account of his fragile health. 
Just then, another malfunction occurs as the lights go off and Miss Lee misses her friend in the dark. Taking advantage of the situation, Ted changes into his other self, the Starman. Alan and Starman meet at the prearranged place, namely a shack on a cliff, where Starman is informed that the mysterious Brotherhood of the Electron is responsible for the accidents. Flowing through the assumed area of Brotherhood's base, Starman discovers strange electrical discharge from a mountain. Surveying the mountain, he stumbles upon a metal door with a lightning symbol on it. He uses his gravity rod to melt through the door and captures a guard, who quickly reveals that the head of the Brotherhood is Dr. Doog, and that he has Professor Davis captured. Davis' invention, the Ultra Dynamo, is being used by Doog to take over the world. Starman and the guard descend to the base when an electrical bolt suddenly fires at Starman, is deflected by the gravity rod, and kills the guard. Starman then hurdles the, to the chamber where Davis is kept and is greeted by Dr. Doog, who tries to spring Starman under his hypnotic control. When this fails, he flees and covers his retreat with weapons and traps. Starman fights his way past the traps, thugs, and finally the Ultra Dimono itself. Starman is gaining on Duke when abruptly one of his own traps captures the evil genius. Even though Dr. Duke seems to fall to his death, Davis hears his evil laugh when he and Starman exit the mountain. To secure the end of Dr. Duke, Starman seals the entrance. If it sounds like a 1930s comic strip or radio play, uh, it, there's, that's for a reason. I have talked about Jack Burnley and Starman on the po- on the regular Stop Let's Team Up podcast, but he has a mile that uh, a style that really reminds me of, say, Hal Foster or Alex uh, Hamilton, not Alex Hamilton, Alex Raymond of uh, Flash Gordon fame. It's kind of got that. He has a very uh, I. I love Golden Age comics, but there's some artists that just I find the Golden Age, some Golden Age art, very basic and very. It's the beginning. It's the beginning of the art form. So, just that. This is a little more polished, um, and I just he does a great. His panel layouts are amazing. Uh, his characters are very well drawn and defined. Um, the action of Starman is. How Starman moves is very consistent, and he's got some great things. That the gravity rod is pulling him instead of him flying when he lifts it above him. It's these dramatic poses. I will say, um, you get a very good look at the gravity rod on uh, page four of the comic, if you can follow along. And it's it had not changed much uh, in all of the, oh my God, this is 41, so 60-some years. Oh, no, I'm sorry, 80-some years since his creation. Uh, it's really quick. It's very simple because it's a 1940s comic. Uh, and we're going to talk about some of these other characters like uh, FBI agent Allen and Dr. Duke. Um, but it's a real simple story, but it's well laid out. It's well done. Um, once he gets to the cave and he's going through, like, the different traps, catching the guard, opening the doors, saving Davis, um, and confronting Dr. Duke, who is a great design. He's got a, he's a bald, withered old white guy, kind of like me, but without the beard. Uh, and he's um, wearing this yellow robe with electrical boat, bolt. Well, it's a, it's a, like a mustard yellow and a bright yellow in the main body of its um, mustard gold. And it's got a yellow collar, yellow belt, and a yellow lightning bolt. Um, and he holds his own, him and his henchmen, against Starman until he dies. And it's a lot. I read you that three-paragraph description in the fandom database, and you might think this is a 20-page comic book. It is not. It is a nine-page comic story. Very simple to the point. It is beautifully drawn. You get, um, you're introduced to certain things. Uh, Doris Lee, his girlfriend, who will be a reoccurring character in his solo series and will play some part in his history in future things we're going to cover in the 60s uh, and a little bit in the 90s. Um, so let's, let's talk about Doris Lee a little bit. She made 35 appearances in, in, in comics, not many. Her uncle is the FBI director, Woodley Allen. He made 26 appearances. He actually appears in... His last appearance is JSA All-Stars number four, which is a flashback story, but it is his um, 
they talk about him in in the the Jack Knight, and that he he is a kind of still he knows Starman who he is, and a lot of stuff going on about Starman, and he's connected, and then that ties into a little bit to the the cop family that become Jack's friend in the future series. Let's touch upon a little bit on the his villain, his arch enemy in this issue. Well, Doctor Duke, this is his only appearance in the Golden Age, and he appears one more time in an All Star comic. Not all star coming. All Scar Squadron Annual Number Three, which he is part of a group of villains who are being led by the evil Ian Crackle, who wants revenge against the Justice Society. And, and that story, which came out in 1984, is used as a way to explain how the Justice Society members were so long lived in later on. But this is that's only his second appearance. And he is, uh, I think he's only seen in flashback after that. He's a great looking character. It's a great design. I really do like the design. And Jack Burnley draws him well. Uh, all right. So this is a really simple story. I mean, I didn't really go, I, the synopsis kind of covers all the action in the nine pages. Uh, I think, as someone who likes Golden Age comics, I think it reads better than some, if not most of the ones. I mean, I really enjoy the writing on this book. It is Gardner Fox. Uh, and I've read up to, I have not read all of his Golden Age appearances, but I think I've finished, I've gotten past where he's not writing, Fox isn't writing it anymore. And they're still just as great. And the two volumes in the archives are very different. Uh, this one is all Jack Burnley and is of one style. And the comic stri- and the strip gets much more fanciful, fantastical uh, in later issues. But we'll get to those. So we're going to move on. And our next, we're going to. T- I want to talk a little bit about the first introduction of say of Jack. Jack is the second son of Ted. He has an older brother, Jack, who first appeared in an issue of the Will Payton Starman series. But we'll talk about that separately. I want to give David his own spotlight, and Will will have a lot of spotlight because I'm going to cover his whole series. So some of the data because they both. Uh, well, Jack was first appeared in zero hour number one uh the numbering is zero went backward from six to zero or five to zero i'm sorry there were six issues and his first appearance was in zero hour part four he appears just in the background he's not part of the action because the the jsa are decimated by zero hour. they died or or their aging was pulled up to where it should be the stuff that happened in all-star squadron annual four is erased not a race as it didn't happen. It's just kind of a, the villain extant um, erases it. Um, a, super ageism. But that Zero Hour 1 and 0, they came, um, they came out in August and September of 1994. They were written by Dan Jurgens. They were penciled or laid out by Dan Jurgens. Jerry Ordway did the finish art. The colorist was Gregory Wright. Gaspar Saladino uh, was the letterer. The editor was K.C. Carlson. Uh, Assistant editor was Mike McAvaney. And its title of that story was Zero Hour Part Four. I'm not going to do the synopsis of that uh, because they're only... I'm going to kind of cover Zero Hour later as an event when covering Ted and the Justice Society. So I don't really want to jump to that. Just to say that you're introduced, reintroduced to David and introduced to Jack uh, and the, his father and Ted is with is is rapidly aged, and is one of the survivors of the battle with Extant. But the whole Justice League resigns and retires at the end of this. Well, in the next to last issue, and then Zero Hour reboots the universe. It's one of those reboots. Next up, we're going to go to Jack's first appearance, and that was in as Starman. That was in Starman Zero. There was a series every issue in DC Comics after Zero Hour got a zero issue, which was like a soft reset or introduction. Some of the other books invent introduced uh, along with Starman was Primal Force, which was a lot of the supernatural and mystical heroes, and instead of Doctor Fate. Um, a guy who has all of fate's paraphernalia, but instead of a helmet and a cape, it is now daggers and swords and weapons, and he is just called fate. But Starman, the seventh Starman, Jack, his story begins in Starman Zero, and that was cover dated October of 1994. Scripter was James Robinson. Penciler was Tony Harris. Inker was Wayne Van Graubadger. Colorist Jeffrey Wright. Letterer John Workman, editor Archie Goodwin, associate editor Jim Spivey, assistant editor Chunk Kibb, and the title of that issue was Sins of the Father, Part 1, 
Falling Star, Rising Sun. And that is Sun, S-O-N. Very good play on words. So let me give you a quick synopsis on that. There is a city, a glorious and singular place, old and yet pristine, ornate and yet streamlined, a metropolis of now and then and never was. Burnley Ellsworth founded it in 1864, using the riches he'd amassed gem mining in Australia. With that in mind, he named his creation after that, which has given him wealth. And so, Opal City stands glorious and singular. The city had a champion, a gaudy-dressed Quixote, pure and true, but cursed with perpetual melancholy, as Quixotes often are. He used a device, this champion, a weapon that could draw power and light from the heavens. And with this, he fought the bad and the wrong, and kept his city free of fear. In times past... For Opal City's champion, no longer young or strong or filled with the sense of righteous purpose of late, had put the costume and cosmic power aside, turning instead back to the heavens to study them all the more. With the need of a new champion, one arose, his father's son, pure and true. So that is the opening narration on page one of Starman Zero. I absolutely love it. I've read it like five times this week, and I love it more and more. Um, I am a James Robinson fan, and I think this is such a good book. I just, I love it. But now let's jump to the synopsis from the DC database. David Knight inherits the mantle of Starman and patrols Opal City. He is the eldest son of Ted Knight, the original Starman, who fought alongside the Justice Society of America during this and after World War II. Peering down at the city from a high perch, David is shot by an unseen assassin's bullet. His body plummets down to the street below. Later, David's brother Jack opens up his collectibles retail outlet, Knight's Past. He conducts a day's worth of business until he receives a telephone call from his father. Anguished, Ted Knight tells Jack that David is dead. Fearing that one of his old foes might try to get at him through his family, Ted took the liberty of leaving one of his gravity rods in Jack's care. He tells Jack where the gravity rod is and tells him to be careful. Ted leaves his observatory en route to claim David's body when suddenly the entire building explodes. A flying piece of debris knocks Ted in the head. A short distance away, a dark-haired woman with a hateful eyes watches on. Meanwhile, a tall man with sunglasses enters Knight's past. This is Kyle. He asks Jack a string of quote, odd questions, then suddenly reveals that he is the one who killed David, and now he plans to kill on killing Jack as well. Kyle withdraws a large handgun and begins firing at Jack. Jack manages to make his way into the rear section of the store where the gravity rod is located. He uses the rod to fly to safety, but Knight passes is set on fire and destroyed. Later, Kyle meets up with the dark-haired woman, Nash, his sister. The siblings report their progress to the true architect of this evening's crimes, The Mist. What a great little synopsis from DC uh, Database. Thanks, guys. I just If I had written it, it would have been four hours of me just going panel by panel, giving you narration, and that you don't want to hear that. But I want to talk about this. Let's first talk about Tony Harris's art, and I'll share some panels. He has a beautiful style. I love every panel he ever draws in this series. I, you know, if he if he's made a mistake, I did. I've never caught it. And he his design of Opal City is it makes it a very very unique city in comics. And that's what's I mean, it's such amazing world building by Tony Harris and James Robinson. The only other book that strikes me like this, where the world is built so accurately, is Pusick and Anderson's Astro City. Uh, the kind of thing that Astro City and Opal City are those perfect, to me, fictional comic book worlds. I like them more than I like Gotham. So that's saying a lot because Gotham's a really well, you know, it's there's certain eras of it are just wonderful. And the color palette, it, um, the colorist is George Wright, but I know this is Tony Harris saying, like, the sunset is purple and fuchsia in the background and the buildings are gray and this neon green very muted neon green. It's almost Kelly. It may not be, not, yeah, I think it's either Kelly or Celery. It's a really weird color. But the backgrounds are kind of this different solids. And then you see 
David standing on this decoration on the side of a building. And he's, the, after the narration, what we hear is mostly some David thoughts and some of the narrator's thoughts or the narration. And he's very, he's fondly, he's Starman. No one other is because he, he appeared in Will Payton's series in a two issue story where he kind of tries to claim the mantle from Will, but then decides Will's worthy of it. But he's standing there and he, and he leaps off the ledge and prepares to fly. Well, let me read you that section, that whole section. David Knight had feared heights as a boy. Now he loves them. He's their master. The device, his father's cosmic device, makes him the master of everything. With his piper smile broadening, he steps off into space and prepares to fly. And then on the opposite page, you see a bullet going through his chest. And it's not graphic through his chest, it's just, you know, the motion line in the back of his cape. And then he falls to his death on the bottom three panels and then the next the title page is the next page and he's laying there dead his cosmic rod broken um on the ground and then we flash back and i like this because times past is going to be a big thing in the series one of the trades is called times past because we will have flashback issues every once in a while and i can't wait to do them because they'll probably get done by themselves or with some if it's retelling a story with its original but we go back to when David's wearing the costume for the first time and Jack's there and Ted's there and they're in the observatory and they're having a conversation. Well, David and Jack, as brothers will do, as I have too, will argue over something and it's of Jack stealing uh, some Lemmy paperbacks from David and because Jack's like me, a former, I mean, I'm, a re I'm not a recovering, I've just changed how I collect, but a collector. And there's an argument. They get in an argument, and, and Ted jumps in, and Ted, uh, Dave. And this is a scene that is I is I love and has struck. It stayed in my head since I ever read it. Um, Ted's telling Jack to, "Your brother has a lot on his mind now. He doesn't need you troubling him. He serves an important role now in our city as Opal City superhero." And Jack's retort is, "Starman, yeah, look at him, with awe and wonder." Oh, that Davy ha Davy has the guts to go out in that stupid costume and wonder how many people are going to be laughing down at him from the sight of him. And then there's a dead panel. It's a it's like a negative image panel, and Ted is pointing to the exit. David's standing next to him, and he tells, "Get out, Jack. Go, Dad. I don't want to see you for a while." And Jack is thinking, "I'm sorry. I mocked the costume. I mocked my father. His life. I'm a fool. Why? Why am I such a fool?" And then Ted's saying, Jack, just get out. And he leaves. And David flies out through the roof of the the observatory. And then we get to see Jack moving from place to place, picking up shirts at the dry cleaners and moving through Opal City. And we're being introduced to the character of Opal City through this. We get to the tattoo parlor. Gets Walks by the barber. He walks by a fortune teller's shop that's new, which will be important later. And then he gets to his shop nights pass. And he opens it up. And it's all of him describing, you know, a little bit just the smell and the stuff. And I remember I worked in comic shops and I love that smell of old comics and old things. I like antique stores. I don't want to go antique shopping, but I do kind of like that smell. Um, and then we get the phone call. Ted's telling Jack uh, that David's dead. And the look on Jack's face is really, have any of you ever gotten that phone call that someone's died? Someone had to call me and tell me my, my nephew was living here and he had died. And it was a gut punch. And then I had to call his mother and tell her. It just. But the look on Jack's face in this panel is, I, I'm assuming I look like that, and I'm assuming my sister looked worse. There's this real emotion to this. Uh, his panel layout is just impeccable. And the coloring and the use of palette. And they had just had that conversation. And they're both terrified. They're both sad. You get it. And then the building blows up. You see Jack get knocked unconscious. And then you hear the door, you cut back to the store and Jack's thinking that he doesn't, he isn't feeling anything. And it's, it's a really potent moment. And then Kyle walks in and it's just a great confrontation. And it is like a Tarantino. He turns around, whips out the gun and the whole background turns red like blood. 
You see a rag doll flying in the background as Jack screaming, you killed my brother. And Jack tries to get, he dives at Kyle, who is using a flame, th a gun. No, it's a flamethrower. It's a straight up flamethrower. I forgot that. Um, and he knocks Kyle down and Kyle figures it out that, oh, Jack's been taught martial arts. Um, oh, and he makes an awful comment. I hate to think that all night men were women, which is really sexist and inappropriate. And Jack is, he reaches back, he gets there, and he, Kyle see, finds Sy Sylvester Pemberton's cosmic belt and steals it. And Jack has the rod and he flies out. And then Kyle just pulls a pin and blows up the shop. It's amazing. And then, I don't know, these aren't numbered, but when he flies out of the shop as it explodes and you see it above on the, in the Opal City skyline in the back, and then everything with the mist is kind of like in a green, gray, they're yellow, almost jaundiced, except for their father is skin tone, and he's just a floating head in hands. Um, and it's just crazy. And then we cut back to the final... Um, it's just the, the mist, the panel that is just the mist. And there's this great narration. The aroma that accompanies his power is strong here. Sweet and yet wilted roses too long in the vase. And the mist smiles, a little smile. And then the mist says, ha, ah, and you two cannot possibly know how good it feels to finally say, the star man is dead. And then we hear Jack saw, I must be suffering from shock. I can't think, to think straight. I don't know what to do. Can't, hurts to breathe. Tried to call my father. I learned he's in a hospital bed, still unconscious. His home's rubble, more of my past gone. I should know. I should go to the police. I should, but I'm not that type who ever felt at ease with police. My dad would. I'm not him, nor my brother. I'm ankle, hip, neck hurts. Tired, I should go. I, I can't seem to think straight. Got to stay in hiding. I, I do know that. Stay hard, hard to find. Like the, a monster's viewmaster. Like Scott Walker on vinyl. Yeah. Until I see my father. He'll know what to do. He'll. After all, with Davy dead, he's Starman. I'm not. And that's just, it's a great ending. And he's, it's just so good. And I'm reading this in the hardcover omnibus. I do have the compendium. Um, that will be my travel copy because I'm going to be reading ahead because it's going to this podcast is going to be an excuse to read Starman over and over again. So I've spent 28 minutes getting to this point and I've just really I've just talked about what's in the books and you know the basics. But I I'm doing this podcast because Jack Knight is my favorite superhero. Period. Uh, in the 90s, I mean, I've been reading comics all my life, in and out, but there, this era in the mid, the late mid, the late 90s, the early aughts, there were some comics that I really loved, and this one is absolutely the most important of that era for me. Jack is my guy, and I love every star man. I love what James Robinson, Tony Harris, and all the other amazing creative people have worked on this. This 80 page plus all the other stuff, 80 page, 80 issue. I've created a great world and that it was only in this time and it is only these issues and it has not been affected by continuity shifts and changes in style. It is unique to its time and it's, it's solid and it is so well thought of and it's so well thought out. And what I like is they've included in the, the omnibus, they don't do this in the, um, the compendium, but they've got this... I guess this letter from James Robinson uh, about the creation about the creation of Starman and Starman Zero, and he he talks about you know you know why he's doing it about Archie about the Golden Age, um, and it's just it's a wonderful thing. I there's not anything I really want to read from it, but it's just great to know his and he does this throughout that he adds these text pieces, and some of them are in these hardcovers, 
uh, where he explains what he's thinking of. And he shares a lot. And some of the, the introductions to the different volumes... He talks about his divorce and how it affects it and that he almost left at a time that the book is part of him. And I think it's more than other stuff of his I've read that I love. I love Golden Age because I like that look uh, that that America in the 50s is not this glorious, warm, fuzzy thing as it is in Silver Age comics. The post-war was dark. The men who had fought in the war were, were hurting at post-traumatic stress. We never talked about it back then. And to think that Viet World War II vets didn't suffer it, but modern war soldiers do, is, is ignorant. And so it's a dark comic, a little darker than your traditional Golden Age all like things. And a lot of us who like All-Star Squadron and Golden Age characters and Silver Age stuff, we like the likeness and we like the upliftingness and we like the joy of them. But Robinson wants to show you the darker side a little bit in that and this. Uh, but Jack is hopeful. Jack questions his world. Jack loves his brother and misses him. He he learns to understand his father. He falls in love. He makes true friends. And it's just so well written. And, written, and this is such a perfect beginning. And that's just zero. The bo- I mean, there's so much in, in issue. We haven't got to issue one yet. So... That's kind of meandering, but I mean, it's just that's how much this book means to me and why I want to do this podcast. And I want it to be fun. Our next episode is going to be a lot of fun. I'm actually recording this the day I'm going to record the second episode. And this episode will go. I'm recording this on January 31st, and this will be up tomorrow morning on February 1st for y'all. And I'm hoping you like it. And I hope you're as enthusiastic about it as I am. Um, so, but the way this is going to work is next week we are going to cover Starman number two and I'll give you a little explanation about that and then we'll be back in two weeks and we'll cover Ted's next adventure and Jack's next adventure and then we will jump to Starman number three and so forth so forth um we will do we may skip um a a non-Jack or Ted Starman and do one of a Starman tangent character it could be the shade it will there will be one about the shade it could be uh, the cops it could be scalp hunter it could be star spangled kid one or two it could be courtney whitmore um it could be some odd star men there are two already thank you to the gentleman from earth Two podcast i have two more star men to talk about one i knew about one i had no idea and I'm very excited, but we're, we'll talk about that in the next episode because we'll, Dave Steele will be with me. He's the guest. I can't wait for you to – I can't wait to meet him. I haven't talked to him yet, and I can't wait for you to hear more Starman. Please uh, reach out to us. Uh, you can DM me at Stop Let's Team Up, uh, which is on Twitter at JSA4E. That is at JSA, the number four, the letter E, or at Stop Let's Team Up at gmail.com i'm not creating a separate uh web page for opal city confidential right now it's going to be part of the stop let's team up network so if you're a stop let's team up fan thank you for listening and thank you for continued continued support if you are just tuning in for this is uh, for starman the opal city confidential i'm just happy to have you that's great Uh, Please check out my other stuff if you feel like it or my Doctor Who podcast. But if you heard Jesser Starman, that's fine. That's what this is all about for that love of Starman. There are a lot of us, a lot of us out there. So, folks, I will be back next week with the first and only adventure of Starman 2. We will see. Um, And until then, keep looking to the stars. (laughs) 